Hey, so something I like to do a lot is I like to listen to lots and lots of sermons, you know, other preachers preaching. It's something that I enjoy. Um, it's something that as a preacher, I like to listen to um, because I can learn a lot from other preachers. It's something that um, benefits me a lot. Also, um, it's a great way to have the word on my mind when I can't actually be actively reading it, like when I'm driving or when I'm at the gym or I'm doing some kind of work. Um, so it's a really, really nice thing uh, to do. However, I am most fascinated by sermons that are controversial and unpopular. Like it perks my ears up whenever I hear, when someone comes to me and they go, uh, they say that someone said something wild while they were preaching. Um, I just, I, it just, I'm interested in it. I don't know why it's, um, I guess it's the preacher version of gossip um, because whenever I hear something, I go, oh wow, that's a hard topic he talked about. He talked about tithing, really? Like, oh my gosh, the attendance must have been awful the next week. Oh man, uh, he, he, does he even read his Bible? He said that, really? Like, it's a thing for me. I don't know why. I'm not saying that it's right that I feel that way, but it is a thing that I do. Whenever someone comes and tells me they said something that was like, wow, that was crazy, I go straight and I listen to it. Um, I don't know why it is. Um, it's kind of, and sometimes it can be like watching a train wreck in slow motion. You know, you shouldn't look, but you just can't keep your eyes off of it. Um, like I said, I'm not saying it's right, but it's definitely something that I do. And I bring it up because last month, um, I actually preached to the kids about a pretty hard topic. And I thought it was so good that I decided to preach to the youth about it too. I was invited to preach to them also. And I preached about the same thing. Um, and it turns out I preached a message that was both unpopular and amongst kids and teenagers was really controversial. Um, it was like watching a train wreck in slow motion, except I was the train that was wrecking in slow motion. I was not a popular guy that night, to say the least. And you're probably wondering what it was that I preached on now. Well, it was just one word, correction. I talked to them about correction, specifically how to take correction when your parents give you some correction. Basically, it was a message on how you should listen to your parents, how it's a good thing to listen to your parents. Um, and I think I heard some weeping and gnashing of teeth while I was preaching that um, because they did not like it at all. In fact, the only people that came up to me after and told me, oh, that was so good, that was great, what a blessing, were parents in the room. That was about it. So it was one of those kinds of nights. But I'm telling you that because tonight I need some brownie points with the, po with the parents. I need some goodwill with you guys. I want you to know that if after service, early Ju July last month, your kids came back acting like angels and you thought to yourself, oh man, did they have an exorcism at youth that night? But what is going on? By the way, we don't do those. Um, it was because of me. That's why. It was because of me. I preached on correction. Okay, really, it was because of the Lord. Um, I was just there. I was just lucky to be there. But the reason I need brownie points with you, the reason I'm telling you all this is because I have an unpopular, somewhat controversial message tonight meant for the parents. Although the principle that I'm gonna preach on applies to everyone, whether you have kids or not, whether you're married or you're single, but especially I wanna to talk to the parents tonight. Now, some of you are probably thinking, it's all good, Matt. I know what you're gonna talk about. You're gonna talk about discipline. It's totally about discipline. Don't worry, I got it cover. I'm the master at it, spare the rod, spoil the child and all that. I spanked my kids before I left uh, for church tonight. <laughs> I took away the Xbox, and they can't leave home until they're 22 now. So it's all good. You don't even need to say another thing. Well, I'm happy for you. That's really great. There's nothing wrong with that. But I know that you know that your kids need some form of discipline. I hear all the time from kids how their parents grounded them about X, Y, and Z. And I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it's not that kind of message tonight because that would be way too easy. Tonight, the kids are actually off the hook. I want to do a message that is specifically for the parents. So 
What are we actually talking about? What could be so controversial that I need to do all this setup? I'm going to talk about the parent trap, not the movie, but a trap that I don't want you to fall into. A trap that I don't want to see any Christian fall into, really. If you're taking notes and you need a title, you can title this one, The Parent Trap. So what qualifies me to speak on this exactly? Well, not much, honestly. I don't have kids, and preparing this message actually may have convinced me to never have kids. Um, Although working with some of your kids already did that long ago. I'm just kidding, that's a joke, that's a joke. Let me tell you, we have the greatest group of kids here at our church. They are so friendly. They love new people. They have, there is so much talent in our group of kids right now. And we have kids that genuinely pursue the Lord, which is incredible. And above all that, my favorite thing in our children's ministry are our worship times, because there is something so special about seeing kids that actually genuinely worship the Lord, the same way we just did a few moments ago. Our children's ministry, our kids in our children's ministry are amazing. All I know about parenting, though, is that it's a difficult job. And I won't pretend to fully understand the gravity and the difficulty of that responsibility. I think that every parent that is serious about raising their kids should be celebrated because it's a big deal what you're doing. We talk to the kids all the time about how they need to treat their parents well, how to treat their parents, because parents are people too. And parents sacrifice so much to take care of their kids. The only benefit that I have over parents in this area is that I get to see many, many different kids with many, many different backgrounds over a large range of ages. And before being the kids pastor, I even interned with our youth ministry for about six or seven years, and I was a substitute teacher for four whole years. So I've been around a lot of different kids for a long while and in different seasons of life. And when you're in a position like that, you see different patterns arise in kids and in families. That, um, it, and you see in both kids and families that are excelling in their faith and ones that are not excelling in their faith. And what I want to do is, as the children's pastor tonight, is tell you what I've experienced and most often observed in kids and families. And most importantly, draw from the principles of the Bible and keep you from falling into the parent trap. So to understand the parent trap, we first need to look at one of the main roles of a parent, what that is. So we're going to look at Proverbs 22, 6, and it's a short verse. Train up a child in the ways he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. One of the main roles of a parent is to train up their child, to specifically train them in their faith, to have a strong relationship with the Lord. The hope, the promise, is that when that child is older, they won't depart from that training. Now, I do want to point out that personal accountability still exists. It is still up to that child to do the right thing and to choose to pursue the Lord. However, a large determining factor lays in the parents. The parent trap that I don't want you to fall into is this. It is a do as I say, not as I do mindset. Really, it's a trap that all Christians fall into if they're not careful. This is how Others in the world, how the word Christian to them can become synonymous with the word hypocrite. It's not enough to just tell kids, don't turn out like me. Don't be like me. Don't do the things that I do. Parents should be more than just a cautionary tale to their children. It's not enough to tell kids that something is wrong, that you shouldn't do that, and then turn around and you do it yourself. It's why it's important to model Christ-like living to your kids, to be a true example of Christ. Do as I say, not as I do, has no place in the life of any Christian. 
whether it's to your kids or you're trying to win others over for Christ, that method is totally ineffective. In fact, the Bible has a lot to say about this mentality, and I'm just going to spitfire a few verses to you. Um, we're going to look at 1 John 2, 6 first. He who says he abides in him, this is talking about Jesus, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. James 1, through 24 says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. And this last one we're going to look at real quick is in Titus 1.16, and Paul's writing about a group that's causing trouble for the church. And he says, they claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. They're detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Now, I don't think that anyone in this room is unfit for doing anything good, but no one is convinced to live for Christ by someone who tells them to, but that doesn't do it themselves. Imagine that they came out with this great new weight loss method. In fact, it's even better than just some weight loss method, like some uh, pills you take. It's brownies, and they are some delicious. And let me get this thing off so you can see it better. And if you were up here... Oh, that smells so good. It's amazing. Chocolate is my favorite thing in the world, by the way. Um, imagine they came out with this great new weight loss method. They, these brownies you can eat. And when you eat these brownies, you're going to have the body and the energy of a 20-year-old forever. How great would that be? That would be amazing. We would all want that, right? Well, now imagine you go to that person who's selling them to buy some, and you ask them, like, so do you like them? Like, how, how's it working for you? Like, is it working out okay? Like, do you, is it working out? And they go, oh, no, I don't eat that stuff. That stuff, I don't touch it. I don't go near it. I don't like it. I don't like that stuff. Are you going to buy those? Because that's not a great look at that moment. At that moment, you're going to realize that this whole thing is a scam, that you do not want any part of it if the person who's pushing it, who's peddling it, won't have any. Here's my point. There are people in your life where you are the closest example of Christ to them. You are the closest example of who Jesus is that they will ever experience, including your kids. So my question to you is how do you want them to see Jesus? One of the most effective things that you can do in training up your child is to be an example to them, to model Christ-like behavior. So how do we do this? How do we model Christ so that others will want to follow him, even when they leave from out under your roof? I want to give you three Bs. I call them the three Bs to help with this. Number one, and if we were in kids' church right now, I would be going, all right, everyone say number one. And they go, number one. And I'd go, be the light. And they'd go, be the light. And they would think it's the most awesome thing in the world. But number one is be the light. We're going to start by looking at something that Jesus said. John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. That's what Jesus said. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. In the darkness, a light shows the way that we should go. And Jesus is that light. And not only is he the light that illuminates the way we should go, he is the way we're supposed to go. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And I am thankful that we don't have to stumble around trying to feel the walls so we can get through the dark and try to make our and find our way. Have you ever done that before? You try to find the light switch and you can't, so you just end up feeling the walls around. I'm so thankful that we don't have to do that, that we have a Savior that is the light in the darkness. Amen. But in Matthew, Jesus says something that to me is so profound and to me is so convicting. He says this. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but that changes everything for us. And it changes how we are meant to live. 
Jesus is the light of the world. And here he says that you too are the light of the world. The same thing that Jesus called himself, he is calling you and he is calling me. We need to be the light to others, the ones that illuminate the way. We should all feel the weight of those words. That's a big deal that we have to do that. Jesus wants us to be like him, an ideal that none of us could ever dream to match. But Jesus never lowered the bar. He expects us to walk as he walked. So the question is this, by the way that you live your life, would you consider yourself to be the light of the world? Better yet, are you even a light in your own home? By your conduct, do you reflect who Jesus is to your children? If you don't have any kids, do you do that for your coworkers, your family, your friends? I remember uh, as a kid, one time my dad, he was shaving and I was standing there and I was watching him and he was shaving, he was doing the whole thing, he had shaving cream on. And I so badly wanted to do the same. I wanted to shave also. But you know, I was like, I don't know, I was probably like six or something like that. I didn't have facial hair yet. I barely do now. Um, and he's shaving. And so what my parents did is they put some shaving cream on my face. They gave me a capped razor and I just drug it across my face and got all the shaving cream off. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. I thought it was so awesome. Why did I want to do what my dad was doing? As silly as it was, I didn't have facial hair to share, shave. Why is that? The reason it's so important to be the light, to model Jesus, is because kids will copy you. They will become like you. It's why it's so important to not just tell them what they need to do, but also to live it. Amen. Parents, you are absolutely right when you say that your kids don't listen. Kids don't listen, they watch. Right. Monkey see, monkey do. What do they see when they see you? Whether your kids love you or hate you, want to be just like you or nothing like you, they will pick up things from you. I'm shocked by how often I do or I say something that sounds just like my parents. When I do it, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm never doing that again. And it's a whole thing. Um, but that's why it's important to model Christ-like behavior, to model holiness, to model righteousness, obedience to the Lord, humility, to watch the words that we use, how we treat others, how we talk about others matters. We have this awesome guy in our children's ministry. Uh, his name is Dylan, and he's actually preaching for uh, the kids in my place tonight. And it, he, he does an awesome job. He's amazing. Um, but a couple months ago, he got in a car wreck. He was driving, and there was uh, a hill, and he could not see over that hill. And there was a light at the bottom of the hill, and the light got all backed up with cars. And he went over the hill, and a nice uh, the back of a truck greeted him, and he totaled his car. Well, that night that that happened, he came to church shaken, but still determined to get up in front of kids and to preach. And now he was armed with this great new story about the car wreck that he had earlier that day. So he was turning lemons into lemonade. It was great what he was doing. As he told the story about his car wreck to the kids, the sweetest little seven-year-old girl, she's the sweetest thing, she blurts out something to the effect of, yeah, that's because you weren't paying attention. You were probably on your phone or something when you rear-ended that guy. She said that. It was like, what is going on? And he said, and he tells me uh, that in that moment, it really messed with his head in the moment. But he couldn't get mad at her. He decided that he wasn't going to get upset at her because... It was really just her dad talking in that moment, is what he decided. He, he, her dad had already heard about the car wreck that had happened. And, you know, what does a seven-year-old know about driving? She doesn't know anything. She only knows what her parents told her. Like it or not, you'll be looking at a reflection of yourself. If you're reflecting Jesus, the hope is that soon when you look at your kids, you'll see a reflection of Jesus looking back at you. Amen. The Apostle Paul said it best in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Kids are looking to you to be the light 
in the darkness, a reflection of Jesus in their life. Kids that learn to forgive have parents that forgive them and don't hold past failures over their head. Kids that know how to say sorry have parents that say sorry when they're wrong. Kids that learn to love church have parents that love church and love being at church. Be the light, a representation of Jesus in your child's life. Number two, if we were a kid's church, be number two, and it would be great. Um, But number two, be the ideal. When I talk about the ideal, it is what I'm referring to what could and what should be in your life. The ideal for us Christians is living the way that God intends for us to live. It's what he laid out in the Bible for us. For a child, seeing someone that tries to live by the Christian ideal gives them vision for what life could and what it should be. That's why ideally we need to be a clear reflection of Jesus as much like him as we possibly can be. So when I think about this idea of um, being the ideal, about being a reflection of Jesus, I think of an actual mirror. And I'm actually going to move this out of the way. And I actually brought a real nice big mirror so I could show you this and I could explain this a little bit better. Ooh, my toe. All right. There we go. So, and I know I'm going to take this out. And for the next few minutes, some of you guys are going to be just staring at yourself in it like you've never seen a mirror before. There we go. All right, I don't think it's anyone's eyes anymore. All right, so, and some of you guys are going to be fixing your hair and all this. All right, so just focus for a minute, all right? Um, So, when I say that you need to be a reflection of Jesus, that you need to be, ideally be just like him, a perfect, clear reflection of him, I don't mean that you should literally be like a Middle Eastern guy with a beard and a red sash on you. That's not what I'm talking about. The ideal I'm talking about is that we would all act and live just like Jesus, that that would be a reflection of us and who we are. But what's real is that we can never measure up or be as perfect as Jesus. I don't know about you, but I often fall short of what's ideal. And in fact, a lot of the times, my reflection of Jesus looks a lot like that, like some nice Yeah, there we go. It's a little bit blurry. Sorry, Pastor, I'll clean it later. Uh, It's a little bit blurry and a little nasty looking. And it's not quite right. If you squint and turn your head, it kind of looks like Jesus, but not quite. And that's how it is a lot of the time, for me at least. I don't know about you. But when you have a dirty mirror, you don't just go, oh, well, and you take it out to the dumpster and you trash it. That's not what you do. You're supposed to clean it. You're supposed to get a little bit of Windex and a towel, and you're supposed to kind of try to get that thing back into shape. And, oh, man, it's going to take a lot more Windex, but, hey, it's a little bit better, all right? So you're supposed to get it looking a little better. You're supposed to clean it up. You're supposed to do something about it. You don't just leave it. You don't give up on it and let the mess become a permanent part of the reflection. But that's what we do when we resort to comments like, don't do this. You don't want to end up like me. When we throw up our hands and decide, oh, I'm only human. Sin is going to happen. No big deal. You know, just going to leave it. You know, I'm better than the rest of them. So, you know, I'm doing good. It's all right. We don't do that. That's not right. That's what our reflection amounts to when we do that. When we live like that, the brownie points that we earn with people, that we get with people, the credibility, the trust that you have with your kids as a Christian, is lost. And instead, your reflection looks a lot like that. That was a huge fail. That didn't do anything. All right, there we go. That's a lot better. Those delicious brownies wasted for a dumb illustration. But I hope you get what I'm saying. I hope you understand what I'm getting at with this whole thing. What's ideal is that you show others that even when you mess up, that living for Jesus Walking like he walked is worth the effort. That it's worth doing even when we fall short. That we're still 
going to work at it, that we're still going to pursue that in our lives. And I'm going to put this away because some of you guys are going to just keep staring at yourselves in the mirror. I know how it is. All right. So I'm just going to put that right there. All right. I should have preached on vanity tonight. All right. Okay. Never mind. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Has anyone actually ever done that? I've never heard a message on it. Send me one if you've heard it. Um, So I know firsthand it isn't easy to do, to live like an example of Christ for others. There will be times that you fail and slip up. Some of us probably did it on the way out the door to church today as we drove down Wilshire, and I hate driving down Wilshire, so I know how it is. It's crazy. But we need to always be aiming for the ideal, how things could and should be, and how we represent Jesus, never compromising on or thinking, eh, close enough, when it comes to our obedience to the Lord, especially when there are kids and the lost involved. Jesus never lowered the standard for how we're supposed to live our lives. In fact, Jesus said some pretty extreme things about how we're supposed to live. And I'm gonna read a little bit of a longer passage, so just focus in for just a moment, just a moment, just focus in. Um, If you want to try, you can try to hold your breath while I say it. Uh, Don't do it, you'll probably pass out. So just, you know. All right, so let's begin. Matthew 18, six through nine. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea Woe to the world, and you never want to be on the other side of one of Jesus' woes. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to the man by whom the offense comes. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. If it, it is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed, rather than have two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Jesus said that it would be better to die than to cause a little one to sin. He didn't lower the standard. He never said, oh, just a little fine. Just a little bit of sin is fine. It's okay. You can just sin just, just just a little bit, you know, not, not too much, but just, just a little bit's okay. He always encourages us to shoot for the ideal, the way it should be. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. That's what he said. Please don't do that literally. That would be, that would be horrendous. It would be some cult-like behavior in here. So let's not do that. It sounds extreme because it is extreme. It's for your benefit and the benefit of others, that you would do this. Every parent that loves their kids wants what's good for them, for them to even live a better life than they have. The standard by which you live your life will be the standard that your kids aim to live their lives. If you cuss, don't be surprised that your kids do too. If you live beyond your means, there's a good chance your kids will too. It's why kids whose parents drink are more than twice as likely to binge drink while underage, according to studies by the Centers for Disease Control and Regulation. Your behavior directly correlates to your kid's behavior. There are things that you may be able to do and entertain, things that you may think are fine for you, drinking, doing church only a couple times a year, watching that show, talking, like that when you get angry in traffic. But all that does is create a potential struggle with sin for your child. It would be better to hang a millstone around your neck and to drown than to lead them into sin. And I don't know about you, but I don't wanna do that. Regardless of the amount of educating you do, regardless of the amount of, oh, we don't talk like that. Mommy and daddy are just having a really lively discussion right now, okay? When it comes to showing others how to live like Christ, if you want kids that stick with their faith, always aim for the ideal in how you live. It means that there may be some things in your life that you need to deal with, struggles and habits that you need to take to the Lord. But it means that 
your kids, if it means that your kids won't have to deal with them, I think that it's worth it. And when you do mess up or your kid messes up, I want to tell you this. It's not all over. It is not all over. We have a a God who is full of both grace and truth. And he has grace when you mess up and when they mess up. But we still need to strive to live by the truth of the word. Aim for the ideal, even when it seems out of reach. Show them what it means to be like Jesus. All right, our last one. Number three. Number three. Be the example. Be the example. This sounds redundant, but I'm going to explain a little more. Be the example. This is what it all comes down to. Be an example of what you want your kids to grow up to be. More important, this is more important than the toys you buy them. More important than the school you send them to or don't send them to. This is more important than whether their clothes say Nike or great value on them. None of it matters if they don't learn to follow Jesus. Kids need you to be an example of how to live for the Lord. And it all begins with you. I'm living proof of that. Growing up, we moved around a lot, a lot, a lot. Sixth grade, just in sixth grade alone, I went to three different schools and three different zip codes in two different states. Some schools that I went to growing up were really great, and they were a lot of fun. There were lots of cute girls, and that's why they were great. Some schools were really awful. They were really miserable, and I didn't get treated very well. We attended some churches that were really awesome. They were great. Never wanted to leave. And some that were just miserable. They were terrible. They were not fun to be at. And trust me, the Brazilian church that had services from 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. where I wasn't allowed to sleep was not fun as a nine-year-old. It was wild. But it never mattered where I was. I always loved church. And no matter what school I went to, I did not compromise on my beliefs. It didn't matter how bad the outside influence was or how backwards the church was. I learned from my parents' example in this. In every circumstance, to live for Christ. It wasn't ever anything that they sat me down and they said to me. It wasn't anything like that at all. It was just the example that they gave and how they lived their lives. The way that they served, the way they did ministry, the way that they were genuine in their example, the way that they trusted the Lord, the way they talked well of the church and those at the church. I was one of those teenagers that I would spend the entire week counting down to Wednesday night because they were my favorite the entire week. And that wasn't because of anything special I did or because I was so holy or anything like that. It was because of my parents' example. And that's where it all comes from. And I can trace it right back to that. If you want kids that love church and have Christian friends, get seriously committed to going to church. Learn to love church yourself and not just see it as a chore. To be, get committed to being in fellowship with other believers. Get involved in a growth group. And I want to speak to the dads especially, especially to you, dad. You have the greatest sway over your kids in what they think of church. Mom, your words are heavy. They weigh 100 pounds. But dad, your words are crushing. They weigh 1,000 pounds. If you want kids that are successful and have strong work ethic, be someone with good work ethic. If you want kids that treat others well, it starts with you. If you've ever looked in the mirror and thought, I don't want my kids to turn out like that, Now is the time to change and to be an example to them. Being an example is something you need to start doing even before you have kids. It needs to be a regular part of your life. And if if you're single, wherever you are, in whatever stage you're in, it's something you need to do now. And if you are married, your relationship with your spouse is most important of all. One of the greatest parenting tools you can have is a healthy marriage. 
A lot of a child's experience in learning how to treat others comes from how you treat your spouse. If you scream at your spouse, manipulate, fail to forgive, that's how your child will learn to treat others and eventually their own spouse. Build a relationship that values honor for one another. Because when you honor one another, you will have kids that learn to honor their mother and their father and ultimately honor others. An example is a powerful thing. It lights the way we should go and gives us a vision of the ideal of what could be and should be. I was listening to a story about a guy named Rick. Um, I was listening to one of those controversial sermons I like. Uh, I was listening to another pastor is what I mean. Um, and he was telling a story about a guy named Rick that he knows. And Rick grew up in a home that was extremely chaotic and at times dangerous. At 13 years old, Rick had decided that he had had enough. With the help of his uncle, Rick was able to escape and he entered the foster care system. Like any kid with that experience, Rick was an angry and troubled child. That is, until he was fostered by a family that was different than his own. Rick said that he had never seen a family that sat around the dinner table without screaming and yelling at each other. He had never seen a man come home from work with a paycheck. He had never seen a father that provided for his family. And Rick tells it that just seeing that was life-changing for him. Rick's direct quote about this, and this is, and I'm quoting him. He said, I just needed to see it, to aim for it. Once I saw it and experienced it, I knew what I wanted. Until then, I didn't know such a thing even existed. He finally had a vision at 13 years old for how he wanted his life to be, what kind of father and husband he one day wanted to be. He experienced the ideal, what could and should be, all because of what this family modeled. What are you modeling for others? What are you modeling for your kids? I realize for some, this may be a discouraging message. It feels like you've already blown it with your kids. Maybe you have adult kids that have long since wandered away from Christ. Maybe the other parent is out of the picture and you're doing it on your own. I want you to know this that no matter the circumstance, we have a perfect parent in our heavenly father. You're not parenting alone. He is faithful and has the power to help no matter how far gone it may seem. You just need to continue to trust him and do the right thing. For others, it may feel like you try and try and try but it just doesn't seem to matter with your kid. They never learn. They never mature in their walk with Christ. It seems like every day they're a mile farther away from Christ. A benefit I have in my job is of seeing a lot of kids at different stages of life. And there are some kids that it has felt like we invested, invested, invested in, and it was like investing in a black hole. But when I remember what certain kids were like and where they are now, it gives me peace about the troubled one. What you're doing is making a difference. It's just a season. Keep doing the right thing. So in a moment, I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna turn it back over to Pastor Mark. But I wanna encourage you in this, to be the light to aim for the ideal, to be the example of what it means to live a true life devoted to Jesus. You may be the only one that your kids or that someone around you may ever really know.
that is a reflection of Jesus. Let's pray.